Oh, well, good afternoon, Troy. Hello, Thomas. How are you How doing? Are you? Well, thank you, mate. I'm here with Troy Rhodes Brown, and he's the uh, owner, but also the uh, chef of Muse Restaurant in the Hunter Valley. Correct. Now, I've always wanted to interview you because I've been here quite a few times. Do you know the Hunter Valley, like people know it's about food, it's about wine. But for so long, you have been almost the guy who brought, if not Sydney, to the Hunter Valley. But the, the person who brought a little bit of expertise in real fine cuisine. And so I, I just wanted to ask you, Troy, how did that happen? Would you like to share with us a little bit about your beginning? Because I know you started at the age of 16, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, 16 it was. Um, yep. Just 16. So I did decide that I wanted to be working in a kitchen quite young. Uh, when I was in high school, I got to year, start in year 11 and the two subjects that I wanted was tech drawing. I was interested in, in um, technical drawing and being maybe an architect because I enjoyed the creativity side of that or the right. thought process. And also food, because of that creativity and that training of thought, which I, which I resonated with. But going into year 11, I didn't get both of those subjects. So it was kind of time for me. I got really itchy really quick and um, spoke to my parents and they were saying, if you want to do something, you're not leaving school until you have a job. And chefing it was. So I fell into a really small restaurant. It was called Pasquale's. It was an Italian restaurant in at Merriweather. Yep. And when I first started, he was 62 years old. And everyone in that restaurant was a part of his immediate family, apart from the kitchen hand, Eva, who was a 62 wow. a Yugoslavian lady as well. So, <laughs> and obviously they spoke Italian for the majority of, majority of their time there. And I was the first year apprentice at 16. Right. Um, which is a wonderful grounding to, to my first initial take on restaurants and what that meant. It was a family-owned restaurant, but it was very small. There was a lot of, a lot of love there, but the, in terms of refinement and procedures and professionalism, their pitch was, was more casual, but it was a wonderful place to learn okay. and spend some time. But um, when I got to about 18, yes. 19, everyone was talking about the Hunter Valley. The best food, the best chefs were up in the Hunter Valley. That was about 50 minutes from where I was, 40 minutes from where I was. And it was Robert's Restaurant. So Robert Molinez was the place that everyone was talking about. And Shaky Tables at the time as well was a restaurant up here doing fantastic things. Okay. Uh, so I put my resume in for both of them and I got an interview with Robert straight away. I got the job and I remember walking into that restaurant and I'd spent three years as, a, as an apprentice at a small Italian restaurant and then walking into this large French restaurant where it's the first time I'd been exposed to like a proper brigade of chefs and all of these ingredients. It was one of those epiphany moments where you remember as w whatever career path, everyone has that moment. Yeah. And that was that moment for me. I remember walking in and just seeing... Not only a different structure and procedures, but different ingredients and the way they were being treated. You know, um, I'd never seen a zucchini flower before. There was vongolai being braised. There was pig's heads in the cool rooms and half a, a quarter of a veal hanging in the cool room. There was um, small <laughs> local quails coming out of a big smoker in the, in the restaurant that were tea smoked and finished over a char grill. Wow. There was pate being made and brawn and different charcuterie. And there was all these exciting things that I knew very, very little about. And that was a moment where I just became extremely excited about food and the idea of restaurants and wow. probably understanding the value of emotion that a restaurant can evoke and that, you know, what you can get from someone for yourself and for your restaurant as well. That was a moment where I realised you're creating experience for other people, which was yeah, a big thing for me. How was it working for Robert then? Wonderful, wonderful. Robert's, yeah. Robert's a, a local legend and, yeah. and, and, and he's well known around. He came to the Hunter Valley in 1973 and he's still cooking now up at Bistro Molinez on yes, the Yes, I know. But when he was, it's, I think it's Circa, Circa um, Restaurant now it's called, but when that restaurant was him and Sally, it had a beautiful big beating heart and um, he was a wonderful chef to work under. And I've also always said about Robert having, yeah. it was Bistro French food, but it was, looking back on it now, a lot of it, he was always just cooking things it wasn't strict to French cuisine. Like, it wasn't. He was always cooking things that he loved the idea of cooking or he... Because he was an eater. He loved food. He wasn't just in love with the idea of running a restaurant and being a chef. Yes. Because there is some chefs out there that don't love food. And Robert has an addiction to eating food as well, the same as I do. And he would be cooking things that he wanted to eat. And you can kind of read that in chefs and restaurants. There's some that are out there that cook for... I shouldn't say cook for accolades, but they cook for progression and trend and... And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that either. But there's this fine balance where you can taste someone's food and you realise that they're cooking for the love of food as well. I mean, wow. There's always a fine balance in that. But I, I saw that in Robert. He's got a bit of a temper, no? 
He has a very big tail. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say, I'd like to think that he's calmed a little bit. Um, yeah. But his reputation in terms of being a tough chef, like... He was a true chef. I mean, like things, uh, he come. He came from the old school a little bit in terms of being rough and tough and the loud, angry French man. And he had that persona around the valley, and a lot of people knew him for that. But he's also a gentleman, and he's also very caring, and he's mm-hmm. got a very big heart. If you do right by him, he will open himself up to you for the rest of your life. You know, that's the type mm-hmm. of person that he is. I've known him for quite a number of years too, and I, mm. I call myself his Asian child <laughs> yeah, because he, yeah. he's from the south of France and he's half yes. Algerian, I think. Yes. And I grew up in Belgium, mm. so we speak to him in French, mm. and so we just hit the highest note when we first met. And yep. I've had a, I've organized a few lunches there with my group, mm-hmm. but I I could tell there's a temper behind there, there this man. Hu- right? There is a huge temper. I mean, he, so uh, how do you put up with that? You're 18, right? Mm. Yeah, testosterone's yeah. on uh-uh. I'm not going to take crap yeah. from anyone I, I want to hear that because the, the young kids these days they don't like that well you know? my approach my approach when I started Roberts was I was out of my depth I didn't know the ingredients I didn't know that style of cooking and I was there to learn and I wasn't there to be hungry to climb the ladder and run the restaurant I was there to learn and take pressure off the people above me and understand the culture of the team and the importance of the culture of the team But in terms of Robert being aggressive, I remember the first day I walked through the kitchen. Later on that afternoon, he got the head chef, the sous chef, one of the senior chef to parties and myself and took us outside. And I remember standing out the back and he was having he was having an argument with one of the senior chefs about about management things, about their approach and and respect with one of the other chefs. And the conversation began to get extremely heated, (laughs) extremely heated. And Robert flushes red and his cheeks start to shake a little bit. And I didn't know him at this point well. And it looked like there was about to be a fight. Like, and I, and my, my train of thought was, number one, why I'm actually here in this conversation? Because I don't know any of the chefs involved and I don't know what's going on. But I think for me to be a part of that situation was setting the tone for me. He didn't know me. He didn't know if I was a chef with bravado and was cocky. And he disliked cocky chefs walking into his kitchen very much so. Right. And he would beat it out of those people. Um, they would choose the hard way in his kitchen if they came in thinking they were great chefs or, or better than other people. And I think he was setting the tone for me. And it wasn't necessary, I don't think, but it was fine. It was good for me to see at the okay. same time. But I, I copped a little bit of flack from some of the other chefs in the kitchen because I didn't really get in trouble much at all. Right. I was nicknamed the golden boy there because oh. I, could, I could not do wrong. Um, I should, not to a certain degree. Like I, I think I just had a, a nice approach in the kitchen and it was very true. Or, um, or maybe he's, he saw something that others couldn't see. I think you? so. That, maybe that as well. Like I definitely, yeah, I was definitely pushing for the right reasons, which he enjoyed. So, I mean, if he was to go and do off-site events and cooking classes and shows in Sydney, I would be the one he would take. I would house sit his house when he went away on holidays. Like, we, we ended up having that kind of relationship. Okay, okay. He became an immediate mentor for me in the right. industry, yeah. So, in many ways, he probably was the mentor, the person who really got you to start thinking, hold on, I can do this? Yeah, I think so. Like, I think Robert was my mentor in terms of food and freedom and training of thought yep. and understanding the co- like the back of house cogs of a restaurant. I think that was something I took from Robert. The confidence to open my own restaurant was when I won something when I was working for Robert called the Brett Graham Scholarship. And that gave you the opportunity to travel to, gave you a plane ticket to London. Yeah. And I got to spend, um, I got to do a stage or work, but I got to do a stage at that time at the Lebrary, which is a two Michelin star restaurant in London. An Australian chef, Brett Graham, who comes from Newcastle. And he was a real success story at the time. I mean, he was 26, 27. Wow. And he had worked in some of the best restaurants in the world. And a gentleman, Phil from the Square, had gotten behind him and became a part ownership in, in, this, in this venture that they were backing Brett Graham which was called the Lebrary. They were pushing. Two Michelin star restaurant, 27 I think maybe it was. And to see someone that had achieved so much at that age for me was the confidence that I probably needed to come back and say, hey, well, it can be done. Um, he was a local boy from Newcastle that was at Scratchley's at 16 and went to a nice restaurant in Sydney, wow. worked for a great chef there. And then he, he had a wonderful bed- pedigree and he worked in some amazing places, but he had never been handed anything. And he is an amazing chef and it was amazing to watch that little bit of time that I had there. But that was more of a confidence thing for me to come back and say, "Mm, let's give it a go. How many years did you stay with Robert? I was at Robert's for four years. Four years. And then 
you came back from having one that uh, yes, yeah, yeah, that the award, program, yeah, and you said goodbye. No, not straight oh, away. I no, I, I worked my way up at Roberts, and I became the I became the sous chef there, and and I got to actually, and also a, a bridge to the head chef with an executive chef that was looking after a Roberts restaurant at the time and two other venues. So I kind of got to lead a team as well, which was right. wonderful, and it was a similar size to to Muse at the time in terms of the amount of staff, which was good because I had them working for me as well, and I understood the highs and the lows and, and the way to manage people. And I had, you know, I was 23 at the time and I had a lot of people in the team that were older than me. You know, I had someone on entrees that was 40 years old and had been in the industry for longer than me. So to be able to get myself in the position where they would respect me and my authority, but to be fair and just and to lead by example as well, which was a big one. I knew I was in the right place. And it was just about the time when Robert was moving on yes. to go on Open Bistro Molinaire's. The chef that remained there, it was it was still wonderful, but it was almost like the beating heart of that restaurant left when Robert and Sally left. They did, they were the soul to that restaurant. So it was it was sad to see them go, and I got to um, have a good experience in terms of management as well. But I knew what I wanted to do then. I wanted to I wanted to create my own experience with my wife Megan at the yep. time, and I want we really wanted to. We, we were ready to do so. Megan had worked there for seven or eight years under Robert. So. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, so you met Megan thanks right. to Robert's At restaurants. Robert's. That's right. <laughs> As industry always does. Yeah. <laughs> so we were looking for somewhere small. We obviously didn't want to have any financial backers. We wanted to be the ones that put it, all, put it on the line and were the ones that had the say all the way through. We had seen other restaurants and other businesses that had exterior people that had a say in what they were offering. And when they're not hospitality-based, they may be great with numbers and figures, but there's some compromises that you need to make to run a successful restaurant, whether it be for your team or for the guest experience that are the small little details that sometimes they don't see. So you need to be able to put yourself in the position to back yourself, I believe, for the long term. If you want a restaurant with longevity, it doesn't need to be a success overnight. But if you believe in yourself and the values that you hold, in terms yep. of that, yeah, definitely. So, so you started in what year? We opened Muse Restaurant in 2009. It was on my 24th birthday. We were looking at a small place down the road. It was a 35-seat restaurant, tiny. So, like, the financial side of it wasn't a big outlay. The risk, risk management to it was quite small, and it was what we were looking for. And we found this place. I got told through a friend that this place was up for lease for the first time. Now, Muse Restaurant's an amazing venue. As you know, it's huge. Big 30, 40-foot vaulted glass ceilings and a massive open kitchen. Yep. Uh, it's a big, expensive venue. And it's the first time it had been leased. And it's right at the gateway to the Hunter Valley. It had it, it, it had the potential to be something really special. Right. And I remember walking in and having a look at the place. And I was completely overwhelmed. I was 23 at the time. And a little bit naive to what I would be accepting at that size. Because I didn't have, like, business training. I believe I was business savvy. That's in me. Like, I believe I have that. Um, but in terms of understanding the real nuts and bolts of a restaurant and how volatile they are, I didn't have a good grasp on that. But I was 23 and I had a lot of bravado and I was at that point I was confident that uh, if we gave it a go and it didn't work, then we were young enough to maybe reboot and try something later. And, yep. and I think that was, our, that was our peace of mind there to say we're young, we've got no hang-ups, we can give it a go and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But and we'll give it a good shot. Okay. So we took the lease to this place. And so it, it was a lease? Yeah, yep. that's right. Yeah, so we leased the venue. I mean, did you change the term of the lease? Like after a little while, you probably said, hold on, we they're did. coming more for my food. Uh, 100%, 100%. <laughs> so, and, and, and big kudos to the gentleman who owned the estate at the time. It was a big um, risk to take on two extremely young people. We didn't have a great pedigree. We hadn't worked in great restaurants all around the world. So we weren't going to gain that natural press that a lot of places need. And, and more importantly, need in, this, like in big cities like Melbourne and Sydney, if you open a fine dining restaurant, you don't have a good pedigree. Like it's hard to gain that traction at the start, which you need bums on seats, especially when you're paying big overheads and big lease in the city. So that was probably a bit of a saving grace for us that we were in the country and we didn't save us completely because we were in the shit for a little while there. Right. But he, he showed trust in, in what we told him we wanted to do. But we still, exactly what you said, we still had to play to his boundaries. And that was, he wanted us to be open for trade um, the same hours as their cellar door to complement it. So we had to open a cafe at the same time. 
So we had Muse Cafe, which was in what now is one of our private dining rooms, seven days a week from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. Wow. And then we had to open what our dream was, which was a fine dining restaurant at night from 6 o'clock onwards. Two different menus, five course, five courses for entree, main, dessert. It was a big flip and a lot of prep. We didn't have a lot of it. We didn't have a big team and we didn't have a lot of guests. So it was a huge struggle. And then we got to the point after nearly going broke and believing in ourselves and pushing through, we realised that guests that we do the guests that we did have for the first 12 months were extremely happy we were connecting with them they were very happy but as you said they were from sydney so people don't come back to the valley straight away they don't come every two weeks you know they'll go down to sydney and they'll say hey i had a great experience at muse they'll tell friends and they'll book in 10 months or or eight months or 12 months so it was a rolling ball effect we had to wait for that to naturally happen because it wasn't happening because we had no marketing budget and we were just waiting for that word of mouth to spread slowly and believe in ourselves that what we were doing was good, yep. and we could push on and see the other side of um, see the other side. So let, let's let's go slowly here now. So mm. you had the cafe, mm. you're working seven days a week, mm. and then you had to run the restaurant. Mm. But the restaurant could close after the the winery closed. All we had to do was operate yep. whatever it was. We had to operate at the same trading hours as the cellar door. Are you serious? Even the restaurant had to close w- at five o'clock when it closed. No, no, no. So just we had to have a food venue operating at the same time as the cellar door. So the cellar door was seven days a week. So we had to be offering some form of food for those day times when they were open. Yeah. So it made no sense for us to open a fine dining restaurant on a Monday lunch. So we had to try and figure out what we were going to do. And the idea behind that was to open a more casual experience, being okay. a cafe in okay. a separate dining room, um, and then run that in there oh, during see, their I opening see. hours. And I then see. flip the menu in the kitchen to do a fine dining so restaurant. So how, how did it go for a young couple too? In the first year of seven days work, uh, okay. almost 24 it hours was, a day. It was huge hours. I don't really think you, you absorb the hours because of what you believe in. Like it's yep. not, it wasn't so much the hours. It was the stress of moving backwards financially. That was a huge thing because you're, right. you're starting a team, you're motivating a team, you're trying to build this core culture and values and show them leadership and show them job security and all of these major things that are important for anyone and pass on your passion but at the same time flip that and go back of house and be talking to your accountant saying you guys are moving backwards you need to be able to flip that around and we need to see that we need to see those figures and percentages starting to change and as i said we knew that we were changing we knew that we were getting a good reception with the guests but it was just that investment in ourselves so it's extremely stressful between myself and my wife at the time. Yep. It's extremely stressful. But we both never worked against each other in terms of that. You know, We both believed in what we were doing was right, which made it good. Have you ever thought of quitting then? No, no, no. You would have probably had to drag me out of this place. I was in love with what we were doing and still am very much so, very passionate about Muse and what it represents, its ethos and, and what we've done to, to younger generations of chefs and front of house people, to the area... Um, how we've complimented the Hunter Valley. I'm very, very proud of it. It's very, very dear to me. So, no, I completely okay. besotted with it, fell in love with this place. So did things change around, turn around? Because you won uh, one hat very quickly. 2011, um, wasn't it? Yeah, your first it was hat? 2011. So we opened in 2009. So it yeah. wasn't that quick. I remember the first year we got it was a 13.5. And it wasn't a bad thing in the review, but it was a 13.5. And it said, this restaurant shows a lot of promise. Right. And that was enough for us to kind of to be able to back ourselves as well again the second year we run a hat and we did see patronage change almost immediately in terms of not so much as you would in the city but we definitely saw maybe a 20 25 percent increase in turnover right. immediately which was wonderful and it was a great bit of exposure to to the broader market that we knew that we couldn't afford to put out there and chef hats uh, something at that time and still are held in the highest regard so it was a one it was a great thing and then the restaurant just it just moved forward. It continued to move forward. So, and it still does. Ten, so that ten one, years on, that one had obviously meant I'm right. I'm doing something right. Yes, right. Un- yes. So I believe in myself, mm. and thank God I did not sway. Mm. So how did you evolve now from yeah, that yeah. 2000? So we sat down with the owners of the building. Yep. And we said, like I, I said to them. What we're doing is right. We're, we're bringing guests here. We're offering experience. It's complimentary to your winery as well. I would love for you to be able to show us the trust that you did when we first turned up and believe in what I want out of Muse Restaurant to be for the long-term future. And that was I wanted it to be not a restaurant that was here for three or four years and then 
flipped and turned into something else or or moved down the road to another venue because I got a better offer. I wanted it to be a restaurant that was becomes iconic to the area for the right reasons, for the values that we have and yep. supporting local producers and all of those things, but I also wanted it to be a regional restaurant for the country. Not not It didn't need to be right at the top or it wasn't ego-driven. It just wanted to be a regional restaurant that was refined and consistent and great and known in this area. And that was something that I said to him, I really want it to be known and I want, I want, want people to know Muse Restaurant in the Hunter Valley and I want to be here for a very long time. But we can't do that when we're operating a cafe seven days a week and trying to flip for another menu. In terms of staffing and, and all of that, it was very difficult at the time. And he said yes. So, wow. Yeah. So, and, 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 and it worked. Okay. Mm. Now, uh, can you just tell us, how did you come up then with those dishes? Because now we got moving into the restaurant mm. and you've been in the cafe for seven days a week. Mm. I understand passion, I can feel it. Yes. You're oozing passion, right? Professionalism, I can see that too. You just have to come and eat. And you can see that professionalism. But how do you come up with those dishes, mm. right? The first time, you're stuck here. <laughs> yeah, cre- creativity is a funny one. Coming up with food isn't something that I do. To be, it's not trend orientated. It goes back to Robert cooking something that he loves and, and something that he wants to eat and try, not because it's a flavour that's getting used in Copenhagen or New York at the time that people are talking about, Yeah, which is parts of that that are great as well. There's a huge demand in the market for that, but that's not where I was pulling my inspiration from when we first opened here i'd only trained in a traditional italian restaurant and a traditional french restaurant almost and i was opening a contemporary australian restaurant so it took time to develop my own style at the start i was leaning heavily on those italian and french techniques and trying to put those twists to what was perceived as a contemporary australian restaurant at the time but then that's kind of all fallen to the wayside now i don't concentrate on is it french is it italian is it japanese we're just cooking what we like cook what we enjoy we use ingredients that we like we use ingredients that support local people we cook things that we're interested in eating yep. and if we really enjoy it people are enjoying it as well and we get people's feedback if there's something that we that, that people are a little bit iffy about then we take it on board as a team as a kitchen team and we see if we need to critique the dish not having that ego to say this is the dish this is how it is this is how i want it perceived and that's fine for some people but that's not for me like we keep our ears open and we try and make the broader market of people happy because it's what we're here to do. Provide so us. do you have a team that critique your dish? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. For the first seven years, it was it was actually the um, one person that I used to get upset with was when I used to present a dish to um, my wife at the time, Megan, where I would I'd create a dish and I may have been working on it for a couple of weeks or, or, or it wasn't even to its, to its finalised stage. And I played it to her and I'll let her taste it and she would turn and say, people are going to hate it. That's how brutal she was. I don't <laughs> like it. People are going to hate it. And I remember, I remember my comment. I would initially get my back up straight away to her <laughs> because we were in that comfort zone and I would say, well, if it was up to you, everyone would be eating fucking savoury mints and I'd walk <laughs> off. <laughs> And, um, and then no one would talk for 10 minutes around us because there would be that tension. And then I would sit on it for a while and then I would always come back and, and I would be like, in, in, a, in a way, you're definitely right. We need to look at it. But the structure of putting a new dish on the menu now is it's usually a collaboration between myself and the head chef, Mitch. Mitchell Beswick has been my head chef for the last five years now. Before that, it was Frank Faulkner. And I've always had someone in that role that has a creative side as well for us to bounce off. And we bounce and work together, all, always on menu, on, on, on moving the menu forward. So what we do is we create a dish together. Anyone in the kitchen can have input, but it's not a pressure that we place on them. It can be an apprentice that has an idea. Everyone feels free to be able to have some input in terms of the creative control over the menu, but it always has to go through us and evolve with us at the end. And then we all taste it, we talk about it, and then what we do, we find the best way now is to put it on the menu as an addition not as a special, because I don't like the word special. We don't do discounts or specials or nothing, never yeah. have. So and it's an addition. And when we present it to the guests, they know, we, we tell them, this is a new dish that we're looking at putting on the menu. Any feedback we would love. And then we collectively get that feedback over two weeks. And then we talk about it. We make a discussion, see if we need to make any changes. And then it falls onto the menu. Okay. It's a big restaurant and we put a lot of effort into making things, having a lot of procedure to get that consistency for a brand that has longevity. Like yeah. That's what we wanted to do. We aren't a restaurant that flips the whole menu every day and that is wonderful in some places, but we just don't have the luxury if we want to remain at the right pitch that we think we, we, we deliver here. 
So, yeah, we, we, it falls onto the menu after about two weeks and that's, it seems to work. Right, okay. Then you had one hat for a number of years, up until 15, wasn't it, 2015? I think it was, think it was two, or two or three years we had one hat. Yeah, it might have been three years. So what happened then? What, what got you into the second hat, you reckon? That's a good question. This is probably something I'm proud of in the way that that evolved as well, is there is restaurants out there that aim to get two hats or they aim to get three hats. They rather have financial backers or they have, have money or have earned money to put into the restaurant and they make a push for it. They will purchase cutlery and ceramics and change the, ta- the seating configuration. They'll pull tables out of the dining room so there's more space in between tables. There's, there's things that people, which is changing in the game now, but that w- people would do to believe that they would f- get that two hats, to earn that two hats. They're what maybe the reviewers perceive as what is a fine dining two-hatted restaurant. We just continued to get a little bit better all of the time. It was a real natural progression. It was something that stemmed from something that was just organic within us. We were a team. We always wanted to do better. We weren't throwing lots of money at something. We were always just improving. One year we got new chairs because we needed new chairs. We were always we're interested in ceramics and we got a relationship with someone who would make the plates for us. Right. It was just slowly evolving and the food was getting better. And I think our understanding of where we, what we wanted to do in terms of how, how local we wanted to source the produce and the relationships within that and our, and our values towards what our commitment to those growers would be, all of those things just grew, all organically. And then the year we fell into that, we were not expecting it. We never went there expecting it. And it was a huge surprise and it was, a, it was, it was an amazing night. It was a really amazing night. Did they ever tell you that one thing that clinched the second hat? No, no. Well, I, I, maybe if I emailed them and asked. Right, but, I mean, right. you read the review like everyone else. I mean, if you've got questions or discrepancies, I'm sure you can email them and ask them for general feedback. But no, I think it was just... I think we had just shown improvement over and over again. And, and our front of house team and our back of house team were both improving. No, there was no uneven kill to there, like... From the day we first opened, we understood the value right. of good service. Okay. And some places where it's a chef that owns a restaurant maybe doesn't weigh in just how important service is to the yep. restaurant. I'd like to talk to a little bit about that. But mm. at one stage, you probably got bored because you've opened Muse Kitchen. Mm. Yep. What well, was no, that again? No, I didn't get bored. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get bored. That was probably... I'm, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm a person that... I'm a driven individual... I'm most definitely a driven individual, but I don't make hasty decisions. I, I really sit back and have a think about things when offers um, get, get placed in my direction. And I remember Keith and Amanda Tullick from Keith Tullick Keith Winery Tullick, yeah. came into the restaurant and dined one night and I hadn't met them properly before. And at the end of the meal, they asked to speak to me. So I came out and I sat down and ended up having a glass of wine with them. And they told me that their plans of building this estate family owned family operated boutique winery they already had a wonderful name and already had a great a great va- great value system on their own you know they had always always just done a really good thing and their idea of what they wanted to do down yes. there was very um, enticing in a lot of ways because they wanted a, a small european bistro predominantly lunch and he was basically dinners at that point and i think there was a part of me that was still that still is that loves that type of cooking you know that bistro french food yep. It was the easiest menu that I'd ever written. I remember when I decided to take the lease, I got to design the kitchen. Megan got to design colours and everything and, and the furniture on the floor. And we, it was a collaboration between our experience of working at Robert's Restaurant for so long and what we understood we wanted to be there and it to be reflective of Muse Restaurant in terms of quality produce and quality ingredients but not the level of refinement in terms of service and the fine dining type of of thing that we do here we wanted it to be more approachable lunch yeah lunch focused more simplistic maybe three or four um, ingredients on the plate and it was just easy it was an easy menu to write because i tapped into all those things that i love you know the basic things that you love about about french cuisine i remember i had this book and the six months leading up to the restaurant i was just writing dishes and i had about 50 or 70 dishes that i had written then i realized that i could only have 11 on the menu when we first opened and Yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience, and the place was a, a, a straight-up success. It was a wonderful success. It was a real. The, the, the amazing thing is how different it is. Because yesterday we we actually had lunch at, mm. at the kitchen, and yeah. the atmosphere is very different. Very classy still. Yep. Very different. I could feel and see a little bit of that blend of French and and Australian style. Yes. Yes. 
Then last night when we came to Mew's restaurant, my wife said that she could really see the Japanese uh, mix now that's coming in that wasn't there three years ago. So what no, happened no, to I, three years ago yeah. to today? Something must have happened. Yeah, absolutely. I think maybe three or four years ago I started to be a little bit more um, interested in Japanese ingredients. Like I, we, I remember we just started to taste and see a couple of different Japanese preserves like yuzu kosho and, and um, different types of soy and just how how complex they are, how complex they are. It was really interesting to me and how it laid in food and how it suited our climate, how it suited what we do here. Like, you know, it's not, it's not, you don't come in and have one meal here. You come in and you have a minimum of five dishes. So you, can, you don't need, to the, don't need the food to be super rich and super heavy like a bistro food where you have a confit duck and a confit duck on like a, on a bologna bean cassoulet or something. Yep. You have that and you're done if you get a side of fritz, <laughs> like you're done. And, and, and this was more of a, it was a dining experience. So we, and it just suited. There was a lot of things... And not having those boundaries in terms of being stylistic to something, we just have freedom. And it was something that I fell in love with and I just continued to look into it and put more of it on the menu. So you didn't travel for that? I, I didn't travel. I went to Japan two years ago and right. I'll try and go. I went to Europe last year and I'll try and go back to Japan once a year, every year now. I fell in love with the people, the culture, the food. I, I, I loved it over there, but I was already in love before I went there. So right, it was, right, a, it right. was a, it was a pretty easy sell. When you go to Japan, I mean, going to Japan with you, there's no museum, right? It's everything in a restaurant. There's yeah. one restaurant after another. Is that yeah, what yeah. it is? Uh, look, I just, I, I just immerse myself. I like uh, when I travel. I, I pick a few restaurants that I think are key to what I want to visit, <laughs> and then I just spend the entire time just walking the streets and getting into it. Yeah, yeah. Right, I see. There's only one dish that doesn't seem to just change is your coconut your your signature dessert yeah, right yeah yeah that's a it's a little it's an amazing thing for the restaurant and yes. i love serving it and i love seeing how happy it makes people feel but it's a complete contrast to our ethos of being a a local supporting um seasonal restaurant where you know it evolves with and, and the main ingredient is a bloody coconut and right. there's nothing local barely on that dish at all <laughs> apart from the edible flowers that yeah. i grow but we um, love the way you describe it do you want to describe it again as if like i'm having <laughs> that coconut right now yeah, yeah sure so um what it is it's a it's like a whipped frozen coconut cloud and on top of that is crystallized violet fresh flowers roasted coconut and coconut sugar then we use tempered valrona dark chocolate to make a coconut husk we brush the side of that with milk chocolate and inside of that is a savoury coconut mousse and then inside of that coconut mousse is a, is a vanilla scented coconut water. So it's floral, it's light, it's not too sweet, it's playful and my, my peace of mind to keeping that on the menu is, number one, it is great for business, number two, it makes people happy Like, and that's what you are as a restaurant. I can't sit here and say we only have a wine list of just New South Wales wine. We only have a restaurant that serves only food within a 50k radius of here. No, we're not that place, but we support predominantly local and we have good values and we do a good thing, but bloody hell, I'm going to put a muse coconut dish on, leave it on the menu if people are going to come back for it yeah. and they love it and, yeah. um, and it's going to make them happy. So, Do you get all of your waiters and waitresses to know it by heart? Do they, will, will they deliver the way that you deliver? They know everything on the menu by heart, yeah. The service team aren't allowed to take anything to the table unless they know everything about it. Everything about from the, the lady's name who made the plate to the final garnishing on the dish and where it came from, how it's grown, what it tastes like. And it doesn't need to be... They don't need to read it to the guests like it's a speech. They need to understand it so they can tell the guest in their own way. They need to have an understanding of it and they need to be passionate about it as well. Huge difference between explaining a dish and loving the dish that you're talking about yes. or being proud to serve the dish that you were talking about. So I, those are key indicators for me when I watch the floor staff and I, and I talk with the management about that. Like I, I want to see them presenting the dish with connection and, and that's really important, really important because the chefs work really hard and so do the front of house team but the chefs work really hard with that love and passion for what they're creating and they're extraditing that to the dining room and if if they disconnect that link between passing that little bit of passion on when they've got their 20 seconds to talk about the food then it's a crying shame because there's so much care that goes into the whole process you know to have someone straightening and cleaning that dining room every day from nine o'clock until five thirty to get it ready to have two bookkeepers out the back all day to have someone on reservations confirming to have a team of 10 11 chefs out the back and then to get to that position where they get served that dish 
and it not be delivered as best as it can be, you know, that's a, it's, it's a big miss. So mm. I understand the gravity behind that. So I, I was just watching you. You're not watching just the cooks. Mm. I think no. you're watching the entire room. Mm. I do. I always watch the room. So yeah. do you have a time in the week when you sit down and go through, all right, guys, these are some of the things we need to improve? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's part of our constant evolution. We're always watching. And my core management team are as well. Right. We, all, we all have that. We all have each other's back in terms of watching out. Those little safety nets that you surround yourself with in a business are very important. And we fly the flag for that. We really do. So it's not just myself that does that. But I, I, it's a beautiful open kitchen. I can see everything. So if 43 gets a degustation pour of their char- a degustation wine pairing and the pour of the Chardonnay is a little bit too high, I can see you know, and I can say if it's the assistant sommelier on the night, I can ask the head sommelier just check the pour on forty two Chardonnay. I think it's a little bit big, a little bit generous. It just we just we know we know each other and we can see. Yep. And I can also see the guests' reactions to food. Not only just get the feedback from the get um, from the section waiters that are clearing the food. I can see the reaction. I can see the reaction when they see it presented to them. When they when they're eating it, so you watching I'm, people I when try they're and watch getting a lot the of it. Yeah, I, t- I play an active role in the kitchen where I really like to. I don't That's like sick. to stand up the front. I enjoy I enjoy plating the food. So I run the main course section, the dockets, and I plate food because that's my favourite part of the restaurant is service with the team and plating, being a part of the kitchen. But I can still see everything all the time. Okay. I mean, I, I, you're a very quiet person. I thought that you had to be like Gordon Ramsay or... And that's yeah. not me. And that's also <laughs> something from Robert. Like seeing Robert, he, is, he can be a very loud chef and dominating and... Um, and there's a lot of restaurants in that old European way where you are cooking and learning your trade through fear. Fear of mucking up, fear of messing up, fear of doing something wrong about getting yelled at and disciplined and roughed up. And that's not in me. So I didn't need to be someone that... I, I didn't need to change who I was when I opened this place. I, I, I wanted to lean on my strengths and my strengths are motivating and, and, and having a good team working for you for the right reasons. And for me, that was someone not wanting to make a state a mistake because they just didn't want to let their team down. They didn't want to let someone down because they care, not because they're going to get a backhand and, and pushed in right. the courtroom. Not that that happened, <laughs> but, yeah. but that does happen in yeah. places, yeah. certainly. Yeah. So I was just being myself. I got to be, I, I put myself in the position. I opened my own restaurant and I got to be myself. And that was me. Like It was a team environment and I was a part of the team. I didn't need to be a dictatorship. I didn't need to be an aggressive kitchen and how stressful like how stressful i don't want to turn up if you're already doing big hours why turn up and be grumpy and have the shits all day you want to be enjoying enjoying it as well so like yeah yes it's stressful yes there's there's highs and lows and yes there's um ebbs and flows in terms of trying to maintain that consistency but like i'm a happy person i'm not going to change that in europe there's a lot of people who are now trying to reject the michelin star there's there's a lot of chefs now who are saying listen you can take it back and sometimes in, in some restaurant, in order to keep those two hats, there's a bit of stress coming up. Mm. And I know a lot of chefs who started cooking with a lot of passion and, and, and love yep. and who are now really cooking out of fear of losing. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And there, there is a lot of truth to that. Number one, it probably depends on why you opened a restaurant. If you opened a restaurant because you wanted to be a hatted chef, well, then it's going to fall harder on you when you lose one or the idea of losing one. Right. If you give yourself a life goal of I want to be a three Michelin star chef or a three-hatted chef, that's a, that's a, that's a big weight to carry. And I didn't, op- I didn't open a restaurant to be a two-hatted chef. I didn't open a restaurant to be a hatted chef. I opened a restaurant to make people happy, you know, and enjoy what I did yeah. and, and love that. And, and don't get me wrong, I love having a two-hatted restaurant. I love the, the customers that that brings. I love what it represents. And what it's also done for us, I won't take away that it's also given us a platform as well. The fear of losing a hat and going back to one, I don't think it would make a huge difference in terms of the business side of Muse. Now, I think we have a great reputation. People who come here love what we do. People that come to the Valley have a small handful of hatted restaurants to choose from. And we continue to focus on making people happy. I think it's, it's a bit of a sure bet. So you don't want to lose a hat. No, absolutely not. And I, I wouldn't want that for my team. I wouldn't like them to feel like that they've let me or the team down. That would be a terrible thing. But financially, I don't think it would be a problem. And for myself, I don't want to lose one. But no, I don't. I, I don't. I wouldn't go and jump off a cliff. But in saying that, there's restaurants in Sydney and Melbourne that are in you know hatted restaurants and, and certain 
pictures of restaurants, fine dining or whatever, they're on a knife edge. And if they lose a hat, how that's perceived in an area like Sydney, they, may, they might lose $500,000 a trade in the first year. You know, they might have a serious downturn in their trade. So, of course, they should be worried. And, and that's, it's, but that's the industry. We put ourselves out there. We put ourselves out there for reviewers. We put ourselves out there for guests to judge us. If you let that chip away at you, if you, if you read a bad TripAdvisor review where someone came in and hated your restaurant, yes, that should upset you in a certain way, but it shouldn't get to you, if that makes sense. You shouldn't let that drag you down. Like, if we have one, one guest that's not happy out of a restaurant service of 90 guests, I'm not happy with that, but I won't let that eat me up for You're two not weeks. not happy with that? What about the 89 who are very happy? But the one unhappy guest <laughs> has the potential <laughs> has the potential to ruin my night, but not my week. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. That's the way I look That's at it. That's a good it. one. Oh, man, of course. perfectionist. So one, one person will ruin my night if they're not happy, but it won't ruin my week. Right. You know? and, I also, and then you've got to be able to step back and say, what did we do something to ruin that, or did they turn up? just split up from their partner or or something's terrible happened in their life or they came here and they just didn't want to be impressed or they didn't want to enjoy that night or was it something that we actually did was it a mistake that we made that's a that's a little bit unfair what about the 89 people who wanted you to have a good night sleep because we want 100 (laughs) percent. we do that's it's got to be the aim it has to be the aim Listen, I, I heard that sometime last year mm-hmm. you went to Sydney yes, for a yeah. few months. You actually, yeah. uh, we, we, so what we did was um, Muse Restaurant was turning ten, and we wanted to celebrate, and we were running through a couple of different scenarios to how we could celebrate turning ten because it's a big thing. I mean, not just for a regional restaurant, for any restaurant. The statistics of any restaurant, let alone something like this, surviving ten years alone, let alone growing, we're still moving forward. We're still doing. We're still doing great things like we're growing bigger every year within our four walls so like we wanted to celebrate that all for the right reasons and to do that a lot of the support that we've had over this 10 years is from sydney people jumping in that car and coming coming up to us and and supporting us return guests oh um, i i I told my wife when i read about it i thought looks to me like he's coming to sydney (laughs) (laughs) he's testing the water no no i wouldn't that's a balance between how much I love the Hunter Valley and my kids, and I would never, I would never overstretch that. But I, like the idea to take it down there and celebrate was wonderful. Get you, it was a wonderful thing. We we opened up down there for one week. Uh, we opened for five nights. Did a tasting menu of some new dishes, some old dishes, and we booked out every night at fifty covers. And every night when we were going through that run sheet, thirty five of the minimum were VIPs friends, family, producers. Wow. And, and we put a lot of effort into doing it well. I mean, we had. Catherine Mahoney, who makes our ceramics, she made plates and vases for, for that event. We had our florist drive down and do the flower arrangements in the room. We had all of our producers from the Hunter Valley delivering our produce down there for us. And we, we did it as best as we could. We did all iconic Hunter Valley wines. We really wanted to pack up what we believe, believe to be a really great representation of the Hunter Valley, take it to Sydney and, and celebrate. And it was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. There is something that really amazed me when I went through your website. You're actually one of the very rare restaurants that has every team member's photos mm. yeah. on the yeah. website. Yeah. And I thought, what a culture. This man's got a culture of a family cooking for people, not, not just people working for him to do this. Your culture is pretty heavy you know, in terms of doing the right thing. Mm. Now, did that come to you? Were you born like this? Or, or, or is that something that you actually had to learn to change I over take, time? I take a lot of my satisfaction out of being a team player. So I think being able to get myself in the position to not just lead the team, but be in the team, that's motivating for me. So th- th- that comes with natural things like staff retention. Like if you're in your team working and enjoying them they're enjoying working with you, then, you know, like my restaurant manager's been here for eight, nine years. Renee? Uh, No, Renee is our functions coordinator, senior section waiter and a host. She's been here for 10 years. Right. Our sommelier who just left has been here for seven years. A lot of our staff stay um, and that's that's because they enjoy enjoy their work and the environment that they're in. So, yes, the restaurant is, the values of it is a family-owned restaurant, although it's big, it's a big restaurant 
and the values are the values and the foundation. But, but how do you do that? Because you're famous. Be- people now want to know your food. See, I mean, it's easy just to say, hey, listen, you know, I've got now different standard. This is now the culture. There's you guys work this thing. I, I create this. Yeah. I, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. I think I think probably a really proud moment for me and reflecting reflecting on that comment is I believe the famous or the uh, the famous or the most well known part about this entire thing is the is the name Muse. It's the brand Muse. It's it, it it reflects if you say Muse I hope that a lot of people think that reflects quality or experience or consistency. Some of those words that we strive for they don't think I don't believe they think Troy Rhodes Brown. I don't think they think of the owner sometimes i because i i drop guests home every week we bought a we bought i bought a van uh, two years ago because some of the taxis in there are so bad so when i finish serving mains i'm out the front dropping guests home to all their locations and wow um and that's before i took your desserts last night i just dropped three tables off around the valley wow. uh, and they don't and 60 percent of them don't know who i am some of them just think i'm a driver and that's well, they're going to hear this. They're going to regret. I, ge- I, gen- <laughs> I gently interrogate. I gently interrogate every single person if they don't know who I am. Um, but that's wonderful because it just means that we've built something that's great. I mean, three, four years into Muse, we had a bit of money behind us, and we were making decisions. And we thought, hey, do we get people were talking about PR companies? Do we get a, and, and and had a restaurants and two hatted restaurants? A lot of them back then had a PR company, a strong PR company working for them. And it was something that I looked into and I thought, I spoke to friends, I spoke to people like Alessandro Pavoni from Omeggio and I wanted to know if what, how reflective that was of, is that going to make Troy famous or is that, that going to put bums on seats in the restaurant? What's that going to do? And then I thought, maybe I just want to understand the business a bit better. So we decided not to get a PR company and I decided to get a business coach for, for six months and try and understand the business a bit better again. No, it was about two years, not four, sorry. And um, that was excellent. That was excellent. And, and that's probably moved me in the direction to saying as well, yeah, Muse is the name. It's not myself. And that's yeah, I'm yeah. probably going to have to disagree with you first it time. Yeah. First time in here. <laughs> because of all the years that I've been here, mm. our story has always been, no, 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 this, this young chef here, he's, he's just crazy. Okay. Yeah. He's yeah. just crazy. So you want to try this. So, yes, Muse is the name of the place you go mm. to, but... I think that the, the story, the myth behind this is there's a young chef that's doing crazy stuff up here. It's probably a nice balance then. Yeah. 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 So who's behind that Muse logo? Megan? Uh, both of us. Both All of right. us designed it. We kind of we gave ourselves a boundary straight away and said, let's keep it short and simple. We need to agree on four letters. The restaurant that was here before us was called Tewa. Now, there's only a few particular people and in, you need to probably have some basic knowledge on wine to be right. able to pronounce and understand what Tewa was. <laughs> so when we took over here and opened Muse, we were having people call asking to make a reservation at Terrier. And it just <laughs> sounded terrible, you know, it sounded terrible. So we wanted to, um, we gave ourselves the, the base to keep it simple and then we, we knocked around with a, a heap of names. But Muse sounded lovely and to, and there's a lot of meanings to muse but to evolve and be creative and i'm a daydreamer i have been since i was at school and that's how i can probably tap into some of my creative side okay um, it made sense and and um yeah so we decided to go with muse hence the way the the the, the sign the signage of it is as well it's flowing and slightly creative as well for right. me now from what i have heard now you run muse mm. megan runs muse kitchen muse kitchen yes. yeah how is family life these days? Yeah, good question. Because um, you have how many children? Two. Two. Yep. So um, Megan and I separated two years ago, just right. under two years ago. And our relationship is fantastic. Probably a few reasons to that. One of the main reasons, are um, obviously, we ran restaurants and business together for a very long time. And it's taxing and yep. it's hard. But we started an amazing family and we have two incredible kids. And um, Hudson is just turning seven and Edie, my daughter, just turned four. Now, both at school now, or prep and year one. Through everything, we decided to put the kids first, 100% through all of it. Also, the fact that we had two successful restaurants and both of them under the umbrella of Muse. If anything could ever go south in some type of separation, some that we had both given Muse so much together. We had battled to make it what it is today. So for us to both say, we both have a career, we both have Muse, and we can both work together and share guests and share experiences. Right. Fantastic result out of something that's quite sad being a separation. 
But we are, you know, we are great friends. We yes. talk two to three times every day. We swap the kids all of the time. Our life is still completely manic, juggling two kids. But we've both positioned ourselves in our restaurants where we're not needed, needed, but we want to be there. So I haven't been on the roster here, in the kitchen roster. I haven't been on the roster for two, three years. But I'm barely not here because I want to be here. So it's important to, I think, if you want to be a part of a restaurant and I call myself a chef, well, I am a chef, but like position yourself in your business with the key roles that you enjoy. What makes you motivated? Because that's what I've been able to do over the last few years now is do things that motivate me. And if your owner's happy, boss is happy, then those things stem from the top and and it bleeds through your team. So I love vegetable gardening. I have a big vegetable garden at home and it supplies things to the restaurant and my house. I've got an orchard as well and I have chickens and pigs. Well, I don't have pigs anymore. I had two big pigs, but I'll be restocking them. (laughs) (laughs) But everything, and, and I do things in the restaurant that I love. I love the research and development, the creative side of the menu. I love doing what is like my own PR for the restaurant and talking to people if I want to do events and host things. I love doing a little bit of back of house stuff and I love service. I love being with a team during service. So the restaurant runs without me, but not without me, if that makes sense. So the head chef, Mitch, will make that kitchen is ready at five o'clock every day, ready for service. The team is ready. If I've got the kids all day, I can turn up at five thirty, six o'clock, grab my tongs and walk into service and be with the team. Okay, so the time when you decided to take a bit of t- a time off or, or a, a bit of back step, is that when you stopped doing degustation menu? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. No, the degustation menu was the the choice. The change with the menu with that was me watching the dining room and watching that dining room when people were having seven and eight course seven or eight course menu. You would see that there was a percentage of people that just got tired towards the end, you know? Like they may have loved the idea of a seven or an eight course meal. Yeah. But it's a lot of food. And sometimes there's a lot of different wines. It's a lot to take in terms of alcohol with those varying yes. bridles or whatever sake match. And, and then also the food and the time. Like it's an investment of three and a half, four hours to dine. I just didn't feel like in the end it was meeting the mark of everyone being as happy as I wanted them to be. So I had to try and merge. You still want to control of ha- control how much the guests see of your restaurant. If you do a two-course menu for dinner, people don't get the whole experience at Muse. Didn't want to give them that option to have two courses. No. And also didn't want to give them the option to have an eight-course menu because it wasn't working with everyone. So I thought, let's put it at four courses. We set the first course so everyone gets the same. It's a great reflection of the season, the time, and our local produce. Not protein-driven. And then a choice of the next course, a choice of the third course, a choice of the fourth course. If you're a big eater, throw some oysters on. Have an extra cheese course. You can blow it out to a degustation size yeah, meal yeah, if you want. But the amount of time that you come here is two and a half hours. You know, and it, it just suits it oh, suits I what see. we do. It was like a little sweet spot. I have to tell you the truth. It felt like an eight course uh, mm. meal yesterday yeah, yeah. because the extra that you put on mm. and things that we we didn't know we were gonna. It was like a gift. It, yeah. And in the end, it, it really felt like an eight course menu, mate. It almost <laughs> is, and I think that's one of the honestly. And and I think a lot of restaurants do it, but it's something that we've done since day one. Is always out your offering as a restaurant and at Muse. Wanted, you, you, your core values are wanting to impress. So how do you over deliver? And it just got proget- progressively harder with like one hat and then two hats. Trying to over deliver as a two hatted restaurant. And this year, just passed, we got 17 out of 20. So it's the same score as some of the biggest guys in the country, which I don't believe we deserve, but it's extra It's extra pressure to over-deliver. Maybe that bit I can remove. That's not true. <laughs> you do. But it's extra pressure to over-deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's how you take that. And what you, with your comment about people um, worried and stressed about losing their hats, you've got to turn that into a positive. You've got to say, how do we over-deliver? Let's, let's work towards it. Let's mm-hmm. figure out ways to do that. And that is, you know, people sit down, they get snacks. They get three or four snacks complimentary that they don't know they're getting when they sit down for a four course. It's a great surprise. It's a great surprise. Yeah, there's there's lots of little 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 extras along the way that hopefully make people feel special. Yeah, I still remember I went to Cock Fighters. I think the chef passed on now, uh, but the a rock, few years ago he did called. an yeah. amazing. He was an amazing chef. Yeah, but the Andrew meals Clark, was Andrew three Clark. and a half hours. Mm. You know, you start at eight, you, you, you walk out at 11.30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Four hours. And we've, it's so true. And we've, I mean, we've seen the market for that has grown a lot smaller now. Like, there was restaurants out there, like, restaurants out there offering 12, 14, 16 course tasting menus. It's a commitment. It's a financial and time commitment. And there's some chefs out there that are doing amazing food where you don't need to 
commit to that to get that. So you know, like Federico at Lumi, his food is just his food is just incredible, yeah. incredible. And there's some great chefs out there, and they don't they don't sit you down and dictate ten or eleven courses. You know, people don't want to be told exactly what they're having. Yeah, his stories, uh, Federico's stories is amazing mm, yeah yeah uh, and he's an, a crazy chef and very down to earth humility yeah uh, yeah and I, uh, there's a there's a huge part of this industry at the moment i'm sure that one or two generations before when people head chefs where were a little bit maybe more protective about their restaurant or their recipes or sharing or or maybe there was a few big egos in the way i mean sure there's still probably a couple of egos around now but i don't I don't really see a lot of that anymore. I really think that this generation of chefs or young young head chefs and restaurateurs, yeah. the level of humility in some of those guys is amazing. They're beautiful people and Federico is one of them. Yeah. You know, good people and, mm. and, and wanting to share and, and share kitchens with chefs and do dinners together. And That's for hands cooking, isn't it? That's what's right. For hands cooking, that's when the two or more chefs yeah. come yeah. together for a few nights. Yep, yep. So, look, it's just... The great industry grows when there's people like that leading it. Yeah. So I think we're in pretty good hands. Yeah, I had my wife's cousin. We brought him here. He okay. came here once and he's actually going to come at the end of the year and he runs a one Michelin star in Brussels. And when he came to your restaurant, I think he sat there admiring the dish longer than it took him to eat <laughs> because he said, no, no, there's a lot of work here. Look at this dish. Look, he said, no, I can see that. Yeah. Have a look at the work he's done here. And he said to me, you know what, Thomas? Maybe not next time I'm coming, which is at the end of the year, but I'd like to go and, and see his food again because Wonderful. I wouldn't mind doing a four-hands cooking with him at Wonderful. some stage. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you want all those. You want all people with different level of understanding of food to be able to enjoy it that's the thing we're not cooking for one person like it's wonderful when chefs come in and appreciate what goes in behind it because they can understand some of it they're they the worst critics sometimes and they can be as well <laughs> absolutely absolutely you want your peers to enjoy what you're doing and you want to impress like young chefs if we see if i see a 19 year old turn up here on a saturday night and i can tell he's wearing his best button-up shirt or he's wearing a tie or something Straight away, I'll call the section waiter over and I'll say, can you just keep an eye on table 41? I, I reckon he's probably industry. See if you can suss it out. I want to know if he's a young chef. You know, if he's a young chef, let's send him a little slider course. Let's give him a little something special. If he wants a tour of the kitchen at the end of the night, bring them in. Nice. Yeah, all the little bits and pieces to make people feel special. Yeah. Oh, that's very nice. So to end this beautiful podcast, what would be five tips you could share with people who are aspiring to do and, and try to achieve what you have done? Mm. Yeah, okay. Tips, it's actually a very difficult one to comment on right now in terms of opening a restaurant because it's, it's a very hard time to open a restaurant. Very difficult, very, very difficult. I believe like we opened in the middle of the GFC in 2009 right. and I solely believe it would be more difficult to be opening a restaurant today in this climate. Too humble, man. Than then. So <laughs> I would say... I would say if you want to be a leader and a, and, a, and a great head chef, yeah, but put yourself in a position not with a, not with a kitchen or a restaurant where you think they're just the best for a certain reason, that, but somewhere that you think connects with you. Food style, like the leadership there or the style of the food or, or something that you believe that is in you that that place will bring out of you. Wow. And don't go, hopping, don't go hopping between jobs every 12 months because... You learn, you think some chefs come to a restaurant and they think they've been there for 12 months. I know the menu, I know the chef, I know this place. I need to go and feed straight away from somewhere else. And there's a demographic, demographic of the industry that will always be there like that. But if you get yourself in the position where you can spend a couple of years with someone where you are treating that business like your own, you're understanding more of it, the values, the culture, yep. and there's more depth behind the food and the offering. You, you get exposed to that the longer you're there. But positioning yourself with the right person is key, is really key. So even if that does take one or two job or three job swaps till you find that place, you pull your socks up and stay there for a little while. Yeah, that's a great advice because these days uh, a lot of young people... Yeah, they want, they want they to like race to, to move. the top. And they like, like and to move. Yeah, and it's hard for me to say... Because I opened, I opened a restaurant at 24. So like, uh, like I was... Although I was driven and jumped in the deep end early, I still I only had two jobs. Two jobs before I opened a restaurant. You know, like I'd... I didn't go hopping around a heap of other restaurants. So, you know. so yeah, it's each to their own, but that would be my advice. Okay. Any other piece of advice? Do they have to be as good looking as you? Uh, <laughs> looking, uh? 
I don't know about that. I think, um, I don't know, I just think be yourself and be nice to other people. Treat people how you want to be treated. And that comes, you know, ego gets you nowhere. Ego can get you places in this industry, but it's usually the overconfident people that are maybe um, hiding something. And those are the people that are usually hiding demons as well. And then wow. that, the pressures in the industry will chip away at them sooner or later. And it's not usually a good story. So I think be open, be open to still learn and learn from other people. Learn, learn a technique or learn something different from one of your apprentices if they've got something to say. You need to have that relationship with your team where they feel comfortable to talk about things like that. Right. Like today, I just, today we've just started talking about a new dish with my third year apprentice and he's just won the same scholarship as I won oh, wow. 13 years ago. Wow. And I've had six apprentices, five apprentices win the Brett Kramer Scholarship since wow. working at Muse. So they're all going to England? Well, one, my, I keep losing my good apprentices. <laughs> like, one, one messaged me last week, Jacob yep. Hobbs, who's working with Brett Graham at Lebry now, and he's just offered him a job for the next 12 months to two years, so he's staying. And my apprentice Dave in the kitchen at the moment um, won it last year, and he'll be looking at going over there next year. But just keeping, keeping your guard down in terms of making sure people feel comfortable talking to you. I mean, you need to be distant in, in, in some ways, professional they need to be able to respect you in lots of ways but they need to feel comfortable to talk to you and that's not just about the menu but themselves you need to be a bit of a life coach in this industry because you get everyone everyone comes across your plate in a restaurant i'm sure in lots of industries but probably more so in hospitality and some people need more nurturing some people need a hard word some people need a looking a looking for structure in their life and they just can't control it outside of their life and they find it at work and then wow. that, that's reflected and then you can push that onto their, their life as well ask them what their goals are what are they moving to the area for do they want to be buying a house is that why they've stopped being a chef in sydney and they want to try and own a house and they can afford to buy one around here in brankston how do you help them get to that point all those little bits and pieces find out why they're here what they want you said earlier you're not hungry i don't believe that either so a man with so much passion cannot just sit still for a while. Is there any anything in the pipeline, any dream, any I'm, other? I'm hungry. I'm, <laughs> I'm hungry and, and I always look at options and I'm always thinking about things, but I'm very cautious and careful about choosing things that will affect my balance with my kids, okay. my life, and what I have here is this circle that works. I have a restaurant with longevity. I have a great team. I don't need to conquer the world. I don't need to franchise. I don't need to become super rich it's it's listening to yourself with what you want i want to be well i, I would like to be comfortable i am comfortable i want to be comfortable apparently people who say I'm, i like to be comfortable are mm. rich yeah but i so. want i, I want to <laughs> i want to get myself to a position and and uh, that i know that i'm at peace with with myself and that like i have this beautiful five and a half acre property with a lovely old federation home on it and I, I just love that place and I've worked very hard to get that right. and I enjoy the work of that place. I enjoy the hedging, I enjoy the vegetable garden, I enjoy mowing three, four hours a week, I enjoy feeding the pigs and the chickens and collecting the eggs. That resonates with me and who I am and that if I started to do too many things, I would be taking my time away, away from, from that. that. So I, it's, balance is a huge thing and, and what keeps you, keeps, you, um, keeps you happy and I kind of have that circle. So. Maybe that would be something I'd like to talk to you about one of these days is balance. Mm, that's a big, yeah, that's a big one. Big topic, that yeah. one, Troy. Troy, thank you so much for giving us that time because while you're doing this, I know your kitchen has already started. Yes, it has. And so, mate, I really appreciate this time. Cheers, um, Thomas. We've never met each other even though I've, I met you through your cooking. I can tell the way that you're capable of giving this kind of time, you're really a giver. I thank you so much for your time today. My absolute pleasure. Thank you, Cheers. Troy. Thanks, Cheers. Thomas.